Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And, uh, thank you for coming. We are in 1 Corinthians. And we're, we're looking in chapter 2, and I'm gonna, I want to finish chapter 2. And as you look on your notes, uh, if you have notes from last week, one of the important pages, I think, in these notes would be page 5 of the notes. And, and I think today's message or today's subject that Paul's talking about it is very simple, uh, I think. And again, as always, make sure you're thinking. But on top of page 5, there are, there's a list of eight words. These are eight words that are going to come up in our topic today, or and Paul's going to use them. And they have to be identified correctly, in, I think, in the context that Paul is using them in. For example, the word wisdom. Uh, I think you can find definitions. I haven't got this written out for you, but the word wisdom or Sophia in chapter 1, verse 18, chapter 1, verse 23, chapter 1, verse 30, wisdom is dealing with, it's, it's the word of God. Wisdom is in the messy. Wisdom is what God has revealed. Mystery, again, that's another word that Paul's going to use, mysterion. In the context, it is the revealed word of God. In other words, the context that we're going to see today is there's going to be, okay, I can say it this way, I think, is it coming up here? Uh, somewhere, I'm going to use this example again later in this list, I think. But in Romans chapter 1, it talks about general revelation. When we talk about general revelation, general revelation, that is what God has revealed in nature. You remember in Romans chapter 1, it says all men know, all men are without excuse because of what God has made. We know there is a God. We know his general characteristics, that he's all powerful. We know that he is somewhat loving or concerned because he's provided us with a world where the sun rises, crops grow, food is provided. You know, we have relationships with people. There's something revealed about our creator in just the natural world. So, and every culture, you know, generally has a concept that there is some kind of God. There's some kind of deity or pantheon of gods that are bigger than us. Because there's, there's things that can't be answered until you get into secular humanism and atheism and modern science. And then try to answer things without God. You know, there is no God. We all just evolved out of a big bang, which they're finding out that doesn't work either. I mean, really, like we said, the, the age of atheism is, is disappearing. We're going back to that spiritual event, trying to figure out how did this all come about. And there's all kinds of answers there that feel come up. But general revelation is we know there's a God. You don't have to be born again. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to have a Bible. You just know that there is some kind of a higher being out there. And, and that that God has some kind of power and, and vastness uh, bigger than us. And that's general revelation, learn that from nature. And then there is uh, what we'll call special revelation. And not, that's not what we'll call it. That's, that's what, you know, theology calls it, special revelation. And that's where this huge God, this God that is bigger than the universe, bigger than us, uh, the one that can create life that causes all these good things to happen as far as the sun rising, crops growing, food, oxygen, friends. This special revelation begins to reveal things about him that we can't see naturally. We can't see it in the sunrise. We can't see, see these things just in crops growing. We can't see these things in each other's eyes. These are things that we have to find, find out about God. He's going to have to reveal them to us. And he does that through, for example, prophets. The apostles, the written word of God. These are things that God has said, I need to tell you this because you will never discover this by yourself. And that, that is special revelation. And this is revealed in, we'll just say, the word. And when I say the word, that's including things revealed to the prophets. Now be very careful with the word prophets and apostles. In my discussion today, prophets and apostles, that, that, that phase of God's special revelation is over. Now again, there, there are different ways. Are there still prophets there? Are there still apostles? Okay, there's still spiritual activity, spiritual gifts, but I'm not going to go talk about that today. We'll talk about that as we go on through this book of 1 Corinthians. But special revelation is what the prophets that God revealed himself to and was recorded in scripture. We've got the written word of God. That is special revelation. Now, so when we look at this second word, when we look at the second word, uh, mystery, mysterion, <laughs> these are God's, I'll just write over here, thoughts, God's ways, God's will, God's, you know, what he knows. Some of God was revealed in general revelation. Just by the fact that God created the earth, it's got his 
if, just like if you make something, if, if you create something, if it be a, a artwork or if it be woodworking or if it be something, you create, your, your, your nature is left with that somehow. You, your mark is left, that so shows your, it reveals, at least it reveals your ability. And so general revelation reveals God's thoughts and some of his, his, his ability. Special revelation is now God's thoughts or God's will revealed in like the written form. And so when we talk about general revelation, this is available to the natural man, everybody. Now everybody decides that and responds that differently, but that's everybody can see this. This special revelation, everybody can buy a Bible. You can go to a bookstore and buy a Bible. Everybody, you know, America's got hundreds, thousands of Bibles that are sitting on shelves, and people read them, people use them to make movies, people read them, use them for, you know, literary devices. Or but it's like, you may not really understand what is in that revelation, because it's the thoughts of God, he revealed it, and for us to understand this, natural man can process general revelation. They know there's a God. But this is going to take the Holy Spirit to reveal this. And I don't know if you understand this. I, I'm, I'm sure you do. But when we read, we are born again. And so, as we know from the scriptures, and as Paul's going to be talking about, they, for us to read the scriptures, we maybe don't remember what it was like to read scripture just as a natural man. And then you got born again, you got saved, and all of a sudden things started making sense. Things started coming together. And this is, again, I don't want to get too spooky on this and too, you know, spiritual and... This is just, this is almost basic. If you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit, just like it says in other places in Scripture, is leading you. And even if you don't have that the goosebumps on your back and, and that, that warm, fuzzy feeling, the Spirit of God is still leading you through Scripture because that is your now, that is your condition. You have the Spirit of God. And so you understand this special revelation. This special revelation being revealed to you by the Holy Spirit and it doesn't, you don't have to be on a mountaintop with, with music playing in the background and angels singing or something. It can just be you reading it and, and a, a, a text of, it, it, it's, it's, I don't want to say, use the word natural, but it should be natural now. It should be part of your nature. This is the mystery being revealed. This is the mystery, the special revelation. This part right here to the natural man, this is a mystery. They don't understand it. In fact, that's why they've got to say, when you talk to them about the Bible, they've got to say, well, that's nothing more than just the words of men. That's what men wrote. They put it together. Because that, that's the only way they can process. This is a book of the words of God. Right. That's just what men wrote about God. They cannot even enter into the thought, the concept that that is revealed by God to prophets and apostles, and now the Spirit of God is revealing it to you. If a person is not saved, if a person is not born again, they, they can only reduce, they've got to take this book, the written Word of God, and they've got to put it back up here in the natural realm. It's just words of men. And so now we've got to find our own way. And so they're up, they still are up in here trying to find their own way, and they're ignoring this special revelation. So let's go back to this list of words, please. Okay, uh, yes, sir. Could, in that mystery... Paul uses the word secret a lot. Right. Isn't that the same thing? Same thing. Yeah, mysterion is, is uh, the mysteries that were hidden and have now been revealed, or they're the secrets that have now been told or revealed to the church. Yes, secrets, mysteries, um, and it comes by revel it comes by through the Holy Spirit. It's in this new age. And so the word wisdom right there is talking, I'm going to say, and we're going to read chapter 2 here real quick, and again, Wisdom, I think, is the word of God. It's been given to you. Now, don't be careful. Paul's using these in a specific sense. Next, uh, mystery is the revealed word of God, the revealed secret. Hidden is what it was, bef even to the world today. It's, it's not hidden to us. It's not hidden. God has, Paul says, I've, it's been given to me to bring about the fullness of the revelation. It's been made available, but it is still hidden to the natural man. That's why certain groups of people, even in churches, they've got to, they come to this point and they've got to go, which way are they going to go? Are you going to go the way of special revelation? This is not like wild, crazy, Holy Spirit stuff. This is just a matter of, here is the Word of God. Are you going to stay here with it? Or are you going to take that Word of God and come out here and see it as special revelation and the mystery has been revealed to you? And many, many people, many churches, many church leaders can't go here, so they've got to stay right up here with the, 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 the Word of God. And it's still hidden to them. So they've got to talk about 
other things. And I guess they can't go down here and talk about the revealed word of God because to them it's really not revealed. They, they don't know what to do with it, so they put it up here. So it's still hidden to them. We're going to read the word rulers of this age. Now, in, when you read in Ephesians, Colossians, you want to go back to Daniel, the rulers of this age are those spiritual forces, the authorities, rulers, principalities, and, and powers that are ruling in the spiritual dimension over having strongholds. If it be in nations, if it be over individual leaders, if it be it, it just in areas, territories. And it's hard to actually pin all that down because it's alluded to the spiritual realm, the, 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 the powers of the spiritual dimension are alluded to, but man, you just don't have a checklist. You, know, you, just, you don't have just a book about spiritual rulers and authorities. Now, the reason I say I shouldn't even go on there, because I don't think this is what we're talking about here in Paul's letter here. Rulers of this age here, just in the literal sense, rulers, it means the governmental powers of this age, which would be Jewish rulers, Roman authorities in Paul's day. Now, again, you're going to have to make that decision when you get there. And it's going to decide which way you're going to go with this, this text of verses is it's going to say the rulers of this age did not understand the, 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 the revelation, what was hidden. And so they crucified the king. It made no sense to them. Now you can say, and again, indeed there would have been powerful uh, spiritual powers behind the scenes working on this, but Paul, I think, as we read this, his, his issue here in this, this chapter is about natural man and spiritual man, unbelievers and believers, people who have received, or received just natural revelation and those who understand and receive the spiritual revelation. So in context here, I don't think also he's talking about angelic powers. I think he's still talking about governmental authorities who came and they had to make a decision. Pilate, uh, the high priest Caiaphas, they had to make a decision. Who is this man? It's like, it makes no sense. You're the son of God. It's like he'll say, you'll see me coming in the clouds of glory. And the high priest tears his robes. He's like, that's great. This is him. He's coming in the clouds of glory. This is the Messiah. He's giving you all the signs. This is him. It's like, but here... Doesn't make any sense. We'll kill them. Okay? So I think the rulers of this age is referring to the governmental powers in this context. Now, you, you know, just so you know, even in my Bible, I, when, as I studied this last week, I was supposed to talk about this last week, I didn't get to it. I won't get to it this week either. Um, in my Bible, while I studied this, I crossed out the reference that I had there to spiritual powers. I cross. It's in my Bible. This is talking about angelic powers. I cross it off. I said this is talking about governmental powers. It's in the context. So I mean, if you disagree with me, I disagreed with myself until last Saturday night when I was studying. So, and I may change my mind again. But this is all in the context. Uh, the deep things of God is is going to be compared with general revelation. Once again, the deep things of God are not deep doctrines. Like here's here's the here's one of the dangerous things. Is this is the special revelation. This is the word of God revealed to the saints. Right, we know that. Can you tell us something deeper? And many groups get here. What, what's the hidden message? It, it's not hidden. It's been revealed. Yes, but if you, if you read it backwards and you add the number seven, it tells you when Jesus is coming back. It's, yeah, right. Would you stop, would you stop doing that? There's no, that's not deep. There, that's stupid. It's been revealed. It's in written form. The deeper things are this. This again would be the general, the simple to normal man. But for the spiritual man, this is, and of course, it, it mean, you can learn more, you can process more, you can put more things together. But there's not like, now that you're in this group, I'm going to go to the next book. It's hidden in most Bibles. And I'm going to tell you things that no one else knows. It's like, no, it's, that's not, there's, yeah. There's nothing left. It's, it's, it's been revealed. Now, there's things that we don't understand that have been revealed to us, but this deeper stuff, the deep doctrines, very, very dangerous. The only time you really talk about deep doctrines is when you start talking about the deep doctrines of Satan. That's in Revelation. Okay. The spiritual man, I think, is basically, who is the spiritual man? The spiritual man here is going to be the man who's born again with the Spirit of God. The natural man is the man without the Spirit, and the mind of Christ is going to be, again, <coughs> this. Remember, here's... Here's the thoughts of God, okay, the thoughts of God, or the mind of God, the mind of Christ. The thoughts of God, the mind of God, created the universe. I mean, that, that's, in, that's in Colossians, that's in Genesis 1. The, Jesus Christ is the creator. He is wisdom. He's the one who created the universe. 
And, and people can find things about the creator through the universe. But now, we have been given, it's going to end the chapter, and you've been given the mind of Christ. What's that? This right here. Now, that's not a magical thing that happens when you get born again. Boom, I've got the mind of Christ. No, this is the mind of Christ. The magical thing, if you want to use the word magical out of context, the magical thing that happens is when you get born again, the Spirit of God comes into your life to reveal to you the mind of Christ, which is the special revelation. So just because you get born again doesn't mean anything happened to your mind. That's what Paul writes about and the other writes about, Paul or Peter writes about, renewing your mind. You've got to now, with that power of the Holy Spirit, begin to process the mind of Christ that's been given to you. Okay, with that, those are just some definitions of some important words that I think are going to come up here in this chapter. So let's go ahead in chapter 2. Once again, I'd like to re read through this whole thing. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to read through this. Now again, what I've just done is I've set the stage, I've lined everything up, I've already defined the terms before we read it, okay? So that means I'm going to take this a certain direction that matches those terms or those definitions I gave you. If you change the meanings of the words, I mean, those words are used in a variety of, not a variety, but a couple of places are used different ways. Spiritual means something different. Rulers mean something different. Mysteries maybe mean something different. So be careful uh, as we read this and make sure I'm staying in context. What I'm telling you this is about is Paul is saying there's natural revelation, there's special revelation, and Paul says this is where you need to be, and you're being, you're just simply going back to more general revelation. Because this stuff doesn't make any sense. In the, in the Greek church of Corinth, okay, it was easier for them to stick with general information. Wisdom of this age. Because there is wisdom here. Jesus Christ created our natural world, so there is wisdom. You can talk about philosophy. There's, there's rules of, in math. There's, there's all kinds of wisdom. And personal inter, you know, relationship skills. All kinds of general revelation that is, is wisdom that comes from God. But it's not this revelation. And the church was drifting back towards this general revelation, or general, yeah, general information, calling it wisdom and bringing great speakers. And Paul's saying, right, this is what the church is about, not this other stuff. Well, anyway, I'm going to pray, and then we'll read through this. Father, we thank you again for the chance to look into your word. We thank you for the opportunity to study. We thank you for revealing these things to us through your word and by your spirit. We ask that we may use them. We ask that we may be uh, diligent with them. And Father, we do ask that we may continue to grow in our understanding of who you are and what you're doing in our life. And ask that we may be productive at this time in history. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, chapter 2, verse 1. You maybe want to follow along with your notes a little bit. There'll be a few things I'll try and point out here. Chapter 2, verse 1. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with elegance or superior wisdom. Right there, that means excellence of speech or, again, Sophia. He said, I didn't come in there with, with a great presentation. And that's what he's referring to this. In general revelation, I did not come in with some great presentation and some great lecture that's like, wow, that man knows so much. No, he says, as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. What's the testimony about God? The special revelation. He's testifying to them about God, Jesus Christ, and the message. For I resolved, meaning I judged, I decided ahead of time, to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was trying to get you to stop looking at this and come down here and look at this. Jesus Christ, and that's the beginning of the Word of God, if you would, in the New Testament revelation that begins with Jesus Christ has come from eternity. He's died in the flesh. He was crucified. And the reason He was crucified, we know. Because these people judged Him. They looked at Him and go, that doesn't make sense. So they killed Him. So that means... These two things are going to be contrary on certain issues. For I resolved on nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. And we can go back, we've, we refer to this several times. That's when He came out of Athens after being chased out of, being beaten in Philippi, chased out of Thessalonica, chased into Berea, escaped by night down to Athens, came to Athens by Himself, ended up speaking in the streets, ended up at the head of philosophy at, at the Aragopagus, Mars Hill, where they listened to Him because He's got, that's a great. That's got some interesting thoughts. And then he came on into Corinth by himself, jobless, without money. So he came into the Corinthian synagogue for the first time, broke and alone, a rabbi just wandering in Gentile territory. You hear that again? A rabbi from Jerusalem just wandering in Gentile territory. Hi, I'm in Corinth. Uh, I'll go to the synagogue and preach a message they've never understood before. <laughs> right, that's going to go real well for you. So he says, I came to you with, uh, with great fear, a uh, message, uh, with weakness, in fear, and with much trembling, meaning his physical condition was weak, and meaning financially. 
uh, and, and other things on a job. Fear, I'm not sure what's going to happen. And much trembling, meaning in his, that, that refers to disturbance in his mind. I don't know what my next step is. That's interesting for some of us because there's the Apostle Paul, the great mighty Apostle Paul, given the revelation of the New Testament coming up going, I don't know, I, I, I'm kind of concerned. I, I don't have a job, I don't know anybody, I'm from Jerusalem, I'm in Gentile territory, and I've got a message, it's like, I don't, I don't know if anybody's going to even listen to me. Oh, I don't know, I don't know, maybe I should just go home. You know, that's got, maybe that's his, I added that last part myself. Okay. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Now here, again, is, is something else we need to identify. A demonstration of the Spirit's power. If you look on your notes, uh, I've got to find this quick, so you can, it's on the bottom of one of the pages, I think. It's the bottom of page three. Yes, bottom of page three. A demonstration of the Spirit's power means demonstration, argumentation, or proof. In Greek rhetoric, the word indicates a compelling decision demanded by the presupposition or premise. In other words, the demonstration of the Spirit's power, you don't have to agree with this, was not Paul walking and saying, okay, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to amaze you with all kinds of feats. I'm going to do miracles, signs, and wonders, and you'll be astonished. And you'll have to agree that I have come from God. He began to do all kinds of miracles. They're like, whoa, whoa, what is this? Which would basically just overwhelm their, their, their evaluation. Over, it's like, we've never seen this. This must be from God. It would be signs and wonders. Now that is how Satan comes in, if you read. That's how Satan's come with signs and wonders and just, just bypass logic in the general world, logic in the natural world, logic in the natural world, logic in the spiritual world. It's like, that's amazing. I don't think in the context Paul came in with signs and wonders and miracles, although he addresses that in other places in the scriptures that he was involved in that. This is referring to, if you look at this again, the word means a demonstration, argumentation, or proof. He came in with a presentation with this special revelation and presented it in a tight, locked tight case like you can't debate this. This is the fact. This is what took place. And it, it, in the Greek uh, speech, when they had debates, the word indicates a compelling decision demanded by presumption, uh, presuppositions or premises. In other words, Paul says, if this is true, then this is true. He was using logic. He said, I came in with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And when I made my presentation, you experience the transformation of the Spirit. This Spirit began to reveal the Spirit. It's like, oh my gosh, it makes sense. I did. And you began to experience the presence of the Spirit in your life. Not so much, it was, it was a manifestation of the Spirit, but it was the Spirit taking them from understanding just natural you know, relationship skills or how to you know, win a philosophical argument or whatever it was, just general revelation, wise and persuasive words. It dropped down here. It's like, boom. Yeah, now you know what I'm talking about. One of the things uh, uh, I, I just wrote this week is you can, you, can, you can give people, you can teach people knowledge, but you can only help them understand truth. I mean, I, I can get them here, and I can list dates and information and maps. I can, I can give you knowledge. I can force that into your mind because now you know the date. Now you know the facts. But the thing about this, to understand this, we can only, the, with the Spirit of God, with teaching, you can only help people understand this. You can only help people get into the special realm. You can't just tell it to them because Jesus told it to them. He stood in front of them. I, yes, I am He. They said, are you the Son of God? Yes. And you'll see me coming with the clouds of glory. He gave them information, but they couldn't understand it. So you can only, you can only provide assistance. And if people don't want this, they'll never understand that. And so when Paul comes in here again, he says, my message in my, uh, verse 4, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. In other words, I didn't give you a great presentation up here, but I talked about these things, and you heard them. What was going on? It was a demonstration of the Spirit. The fact that you understood Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and it changed your life, that's not natural. That was the Spirit taking that hidden message and bringing it to life and understanding, and it transforms your life. And he's going to call them, they are born again. It's happened to them. And that, I think, is a demonstration of the Spirit's power. The Spirit took information that was hidden, revealed it to them, they believed it, they accepted it, and it transformed their lives. That, I think, is the demonstration of the power he's talking about. Well, let's go on. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration 
of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. It wasn't on some kind of a locked down tight argument as much as it was about the Spirit revealing to you information that was solid. And it was no longer resting on Paul's wise and persuasive words, but on God's power. God's power from his revelation. Okay, verse 6. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature. Now, here we got to be fine. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. So what is he talking about here? We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature. It, it, he could be talking about babes in Christ, that as you grow, he's going to go on beyond just simply Jesus Christ came and died and was resurrected. He's going to now start making an application. Maybe see that in the book of Romans, what this means. Justified, redemption, uh, all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. It's like you're now in the plan. You're, you're moving through. They may be talking about something to that effect. Or he's, it could simply be this. He talks about, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom. Again, what is wisdom in our definition? Wisdom is this. We do have a message of special revelation for the mature. The mature, the word is teleos. It means complete. It means mature. Uh, it, it is used for the end of the age. So that could mean a wisdom among the teleos, a wisdom among the mature. You can say it this way. We do have a message of wisdom, the special revelation, for those who are complete. Now again, does that mean mature in the sense of maturing in Christ through a process? Or is it talking about being complete in Christ, having the Spirit of God? And I could go either way on this. I like right now, I like the idea that the Corinthians are now the mature. You are, I, we do have a message of special, a message of wisdom from God for those who are complete, mature in Christ in the sense of being born again with the presence of the Spirit. Not talking about a process, meaning you've, now you've gotten mature. Now that you're mature, we're going to talk about the deep things of God. As much as now that you have the Spirit of God, you've understood the gospel message, we have more to say. We do have some wisdom to share with you, and thus the rest of the New Testament. So I like to look at it that way. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom, meaning God's revelation, among the mature, among those who are saved. But not the wisdom of this age. But he says, I'm not, when I get to a group of people, Paul saying, like the Corinthians, we do have this message to share with those who are complete in Christ, who have the Holy Spirit, the mature, the complete ones. Again, I remember, I'm, talking about, I'm using the word mature in two different ways here. Mature or complete in Christ, you are born again, you're complete, you're mature. But we do know also that there's a maturing process during your Christian life. So again, that's what's tough about this chapter. Some of these words are, are talking about different phases of the Christian experience. He says, but he said, I do have a message of wisdom for the mature, those who are saved, but not a message of this age. I'm not going to go back and teach you something you're familiar with. I'm not going to go and teach you something that you're comfortable with. I'm not going to go back and teach you Greek philosophy. I'm not going to go back and teach you the way that we work our culture. I'm going to teach you this revelation because you are now mature. You are now equipped with the Holy Spirit, ready to understand this wisdom from God. I'm not going to go back up here. Well, that, we all agree with that. See, and I, and I just... I, it seems like I'm talking about the same thing every week, but I'm just reading the text of Scripture, okay? We're eventually going to turn some pages and we become something completely different. But if you get a group of Christians together and, and you start dropping down into here, they're going to have to rely on the Holy Spirit to understand this special revelation. I think that is the purpose of the church, is to equip the saints with the Word of God. But not everybody feels comfortable with that. They feel more comfortable where? Up here, hearing general information. Things about sunrises and things about relationships and things about, you know, just, you know, basic life principles. It's like, right, there's a place for that because we all live here. We've got to all improve our general natural life. But the special message of the church, the wisdom that the church has been, the church is an institution established by God to provide the believers and the world with this special revelation. The church is not an institution established by God to help them understand general revelation. I mean, that there's, already, there's already institutions doing that, you know, from family to schools to governments that are teaching and establishing this. Now, the church can affect this, but this is what Paul said. I didn't come up here and teach you Greek philosophy. I'm teaching you God's wisdom. All right, we go on. We do have a message of, of wisdom, God's revelation, among the mature, among the believers. 
but not the wisdom of this age, which is general revelation, or of the rulers of this age. Now, this is that, there's that line right there. The wisdom of this age, which would be you know, Greek philosophy for the Corinthians, or the rulers of this age, which would be what their government officials would accept. And this is where you've got to decide, are we talking here about rulers of this age being angelic forces? Or are we talking about government officials like Jewish leaders, Roman leaders, Pilate and Caiaphas? And you'll notice this, who are coming to nothing. Now, if you look over there, if you get to go to your notes, you can, I've got this written out here somewhere again. Uh, I don't even see where it's at in my notes. But if you go back to uh, uh, what is in that verse last week, verse 28 of chapter 1. Remember this right here, this verse? Chapter 1, verse 20, it's the same word. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, the things that are not. Remember that, right? The things that are not. That word that means the things without being, the things that are, have no existence. They don't even exist. To nullify, that means to neutralize, to put them out of effect, to they're no longer applicable, they've been put out of commission, to nullify the things that are. In other words, in chapter 1, verse 28, Paul says, God has taken the things with no being. And that was, that was a huge, you know, that was very derogatory. I mean, they, they don't exist. And when he says the things without being, he was talking about, I think, and I think it's, if you understand this, he was talking about these things. Because in the natural world, God's special revelation, God, what would they, the mystery, the things that were hidden, they have no being. Because they don't exist. And no one can understand it. They, it's like, uh, you know, it's like trigonometry is to me. It's like, it's, it's, it has no meaning to me. It's like, you can write on the board, you can talk about it. I have no idea what you're talking about. I can't use that. It has no being, no, no meaning in my life. And so God is taking the things with no being, his special revelation, and neutralizing, nullifying, putting out of commission the things that are. The things that no one understands. He's using them to put out of commission the things that you hold dearly, that you say, these are the absolutes. Nothing's going to change it. Rome is always going to rule the world. Right. God is taking the things that you don't even understand and putting the Roman Empire, for example, out of commission. It's no longer going to exist. The things that you value. In other words, it is written in the sense to, in the, in, the, in the present tense, which means that we're going to go back to read here in chapter 2. It's already begun. It's already begun. When Jesus Christ stood in front of Caiaphas, stood in front of the high priest, stood in front of Pilate, and they go, we don't even understand what you're saying. Pilate says, what is true? Jesus is given this. He says, yeah, I come from a kingdom that, that is not here. He said, if this, was my, if this was my kingdom, these people would fight for me. They fought for Herod. They fought for the high priest. They fought for the Maccabees. But he says, my kingdom, they can't see it. So they're not going to fight for it. And eventually Pilate says, well, what is truth? Jesus said, I came to testify about the truth. I came to tell you about this. Paul said, ah, yeah, you've lost. I, what is truth? What, what, who knows what truth is? Guards, say to the Caiaphas, he says, oh, tell us plainly, tell us plainly, are you the son of God? I am. <laughs> he said, I am. He used the, you know, I am. And he says, and you will see the son of man coming in the clouds of glory. They tore their clothes. They said, that's blasphemy. That's, that makes no sense. You're blaspheming. He said, Jesus was saying, he was telling them the things that have no being. They, they have great meaning. They are, in a sense, absolute reality. But in this world, they have no being. So it says right there in 1 Corinthians 1.28, God is using the things that have no being to nullify, to put out of effect, put out of commission, the things that are. Okay? So here we go. We're back in chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 6, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature. We do teach the word to the believers who have the spirit, but it's not the wisdom of this age. We're not teaching them things they already understand, things they already know, nor or of the rulers of this age. We're not teaching them the things of their government officials, the things of their Greek philosophers, the things of the Jewish scribes, who are coming to nothing. There's your word, no. Who are being brought to nothing. That, that's the same word. The things that are not are, are nullifying the things that are. The same word. Who are coming to nothing. No, no, he says. We speak of God's secret wisdom. Now again, don't get, oh, oh where's this secret wisdom? Then the problem with this is Christians, many times, want to say, yes, we're looking for that secret wisdom. No, no, this is it. <laughs> 
It's, it's, it's like we want something secret, something spiritual, something that makes us just stand in amazement. Right, yeah, yeah, this is it. Jesus Christ came, Jesus Christ died, Jesus Christ resurrected and ascended into heaven. And he began the church, gave you the spirit so you can understand what God is doing. Oh, yeah, we've already heard that. Is there anything else? It's like, well, you can go back and talk about these things if you want to, or you can continue to study this. No, he says, we, we speak of God's secret wisdom, which is this revelation, a wisdom that has been hidden, it wasn't revealed until the New Testament time, and that God has destined for our glory before time began. The revealing of this word, the understanding of this word, more than mere words of men, the revealing of this word was God's plan to, from the beginning of time, to reveal to the believers who accepted Jesus Christ and were filled with the Spirit so that you can understand this, and this is going to result in your glory in eternity. Because... The things that are not, the things that people don't understand, are being used to nullify the things that are. And God is using the same thing, the things that you don't understand. The Word of God is revealing it to your heart. And you're being transformed and getting ready for a kingdom that isn't even here yet, but it's coming. And when it does come, if you've understood this, if you've embraced this, if you've been renewed with this, you'll be part of it. And when that kingdom comes, it won't just destroy you. It won't just leave you empty. It will fill you with glory because you will match the kingdom that is coming. This is the textbook of the kingdom that is coming. And when you have this in your soul, when you allow Paul to teach you, if you're a Corinthian, this information, when that kingdom comes and this age is nullified by the coming age, you will be filled with glory because you're already there. You're thinking these thoughts. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, the word of God, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God is destined for our glory before time began. Verse 8. None of the rulers of this age understood it. Again, in context, you don't have to agree with this, you need to keep studying. I changed my mind when I studied it this time. None of the rulers of this age, Pilate, Caiaphas, the Pharisees, any of the Roman guards, understood this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they understood, when he says, they said, are you the Son of God? I am. You'll see the Son of God coming in clouds of glory. If they understood that, what would Caiaphas have done? Fallen on his face, bowed his knee, asked him, what should I do next? If Pilate had understood Jesus, he says, my kingdom is not of this age. I have come to testify the truth. Pilate would have said, okay, I'm all ears. Help me. Instead of just mocking what is true. He would have said, okay, tell me, what is truth? But said, he says, what is truth? But he says, what is truth? Well, yeah, that, what a quiet, everybody's asking that. They come on, let's take him out. So I mean, they would have responded differently. If the rulers of this age had understood they would not have crucified the king of glory. They would have let him tell them what was truth. They would have bowed their knee instead of ripping their garments and saying he was blasphemy. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, why is Paul telling him this? Is because the Corinthian church is drifting, not really drifting, they've gone straight back up to here and are looking for this. He says, you're getting in with the group that when Jesus Christ is revealed, you will say blasphemy. Or you'll mock him and say, how does anyone know what the truth is? Everyone's looking for truth. He says, you need to stay down here so that when Jesus Christ is revealed, you will ask him, tell me the truth, or you will bow your knee. But he says, no, these rulers didn't understand it, and that's where you're heading. You're heading right back to just the general knowledge, general information, Greek philosophy. And when, this thing's, when these things all start to take place, you're going to be in the wrong place. Okay, verse, verse chapter 9, chapter 2, verse 9. However, however... That is not your case. You are not of those who are of this age and do not understand. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. In other words, if you are going to stay right here, if you're Caiaphas, if you're Pilate, if you're going to stay up here as a, as a Corinthian church and just have you know, the, the great orators come by and, and make great presentations, then write. You, you're going to look at this book and say, who can understand it? No eye has seen, no mind has heard. No one can see, conceive what God has prepared for those. I don't know if you've ever heard that. You ever heard that, had that argument? As a Bible teacher, I get that a lot. I say, well, yeah, there's a lot of opinions. No one really knows. And the fact is probably just written by men, just, you know, political propaganda. No one knows. They'll say, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those. No one knows. No one knows. Right, that sounds good up here because you don't know. But if you have been born again and the Spirit of God is living in you, then these secret things have been revealed to you. You've, been, you've received a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And the verse ends like this. Paul adds, verse 10, 
He quotes that scripture. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, but no mind has conceived, but God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. In other words, he's saying, that's true if you're up here. But us, we do know. How do we know? Because we're smart? No. It's been revealed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come. The miracle of your Christian life, the biggest, I mean, besides being born again, this all ties together, and being saved and going on into eternity upon your death into the presence of Jesus Christ, the greatest miracle is the Spirit of God has come into your life so that when you read the mystery of God, it's like, wow, I see it. I understand this. That is the miracle is the Spirit of God. Again, but God has revealed to us by His Spirit. You do understand the thing the world stands in mocks, the world thinks the world shakes out. No one knows. Who understands? It's like, I do. I understand. Why? Not because I'm great, but God gave me my, the Holy Spirit so that I can, so it can be revealed to me. And Paul's trying, he's arguing with the Corinthians saying, would you guys come back down here in the land of wonder, the land of miracles, the land of the power of the Holy Spirit? You were talking about just understanding the revelation of God. The Spirit searches all night. He just kind of closes this whole chapter down with a basic idea. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. In other words, the, the Spirit sees everything. It taps all the phones. It's got all the satellite dishes. It, can, it sees everything. It's, it can zoom in on you. It can tap in. It hears every one of your conversations. It knows all things. But not just all things of, the, of man. It's also phone tapping God. The Spirit knows everything God is thinking, if you want to explain it that way. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. The things that are deep in the heart of God, the Spirit has access to Him. Why? Because in our theology, He is God. The Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So the Spirit knows everything God is saying, everything Christ wants to do. The Spirit knows and is helping with that. And that is the Spirit that has come into you. Is that not, I mean, it's, it's really real simple if you think about it. you got your Trinity. This is God the Father. He's got the eternal plan. You got God the Son who works the eternal plan. So God says, This is what I want to do. The Son says, I will do it. Okay? But no one knows what's going on. No one knows these things. This is eternal God talking to eternal God in eternity past. And we're down here. We're a mere man made out of dirt. Right here, it's like, Whoa, we have no idea. All we do is see the natural things. We just see the natural world. And God the whole and the Son, we got these great plans. We just want to know if it's going to rain tomorrow. We want to know what's for dinner. Like, that's, that's, what's, that's the mystery. What are we going to eat for lunch? It's like, that's what we're concerned about. So how are we going to handle this? Well, see the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is also God. This is God. This is called the Godhead. God. And God is the Father. God is the Son. God is the Holy Spirit. No one's ever seen the Father. The Son reveals the Father. He comes to earth and walked amongst, and then he went back to heaven. But he says, don't worry, I'm leaving, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, which is just like me. He's a comforter just like me, and he's going to come to you. Boom. And now all of a sudden, you have access. You don't have access to the Father directly, per se, or to the Son, per se. That's a, that, that's a theologically incorrect statement right there. But what you have direct access to is what? The Holy Spirit. Oh, I, wish the, I wish I had the Son. It's the same Godhead. He has the mind. They, they share the same thoughts, the same mind. They are the same essence. And he has come into you. That's the amazing part of the church. The spirit of the eternal God lives in you. He hasn't replaced your spirit. You're not, in a sense, dead, no longer just possessed by the spirit of God. He has come in to assist your, your spirit. He's come in to assist your life. He's come in to reveal these things to you. He is living with you. That's what Paul is saying right here. Let me read this again. But, the spirit, but God is revealed to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. The Spirit, who you have, is up here. This is His existence. He searches the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? Paul, very simple. You, I, I'm telling you what I'm thinking. But I'm only telling you what I want you to know. There's other things in my head. I ain't going to say that. You don't know what's in my head. I have no idea what you're thinking. You may be thinking, what time is it? I don't know. I like to think you're thinking, I hope he never quits talking. You can tell I think that. It's like, but it's like, we don't know. And I don't know that he, I'm married to Tony. And we share thoughts. We share ideas. I know a lot about Tony. But there's things that Tony knows enough. I'm not going to say that. And I know enough. There's certain things. I'm not going to say that out loud. You know, so there's certain things we even share, don't share. And that's, that's not, even if we try to share everything, you can't share everything. Who else knows the heart of a man except the man himself? That's the point. Who else knows what God is doing except God? God only knows, besides the fact that he's beyond our understanding, 
No one's going to stand God except God. Okay? And you know where this is going. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. Now just imagine, if Tony could somehow, we, we share a lot together, we spent 30-some years together, I don't want to put a number on, maybe 32, 32, I don't know how long it's been, I didn't have to do the math. It's been a great time, and we talk about it, I don't want it to end. But there's certain things that I can't understand about Tony and certain things she's just kind of come to accept about me. I don't understand that. Wouldn't it be nice if Tony could take part of her spirit and put it in me? So when she says, you know, how does this look? The little voice would say, she wants you to say, it looks good. You know, or what, you know, it's like you wouldn't say the duck and say, how's this look? Uh, oh, I, should, I, I didn't know that's what you want. I'm trying to read. And I read her real good. I think it's a, I, we spent all the time together. I'm, I'm just using this as an example, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so they're going to end up in a fight this afternoon. But I mean, the point is, wouldn't it be nice if she could put her spirit in there? So whenever she would say something, there'd be this little per part of her inside saying, this is what she meant. And she'd open it and oh. And we'd always be in fellowship. Or at least there'd be this potential. That is what, that is, that is not like, kind of like, that is. It, 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 he, the spirit of God lives in me. Tony's spirit can't separate and come live in me. It's not going to happen. Unless you're in some kind of science fiction movies or some, you know, alternate universe theories or something. That's not going to happen. But this did. The Holy Spirit does live in you. Again, I'm going to say, that's the miracle of the church age. We're not just having access to God through Jesus Christ by faith. That's all true. But Jesus also says, I'll, I'll take you to the Father. You have access to the Father through me. But he says, ah, you're still going to have trouble. i tell you what I'll do. I'll take my spirit and put it in you. There we go. Now you know exactly what I want you to do. And it's not, again, we're not talking about picking out cereal in the grocery aisle. We're talking about understanding this special revelation that is here, that, that the mystery that's been hidden and now revealed to the, the apostles and prophets. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, verse, wherever, verse 11. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except the spirits, man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. It's a great word right there, freely. I, mean, I, I gave this whole package of grace. Here it is. But you don't even know what it is yet. You've got this great package, but you don't have enough sense to open it. Right. The Holy Spirit's going to come and say, you should probably open that. Let me tell you how to use it. This is incredible. This is what we speak. Not in words taught, by, uh, taught to us by human wisdom. In other words, he says, this is what we're speaking. When I come to your church, Paul says, I'm not speaking Greek philosophy. I'm not telling you how to have better relationships. I'm telling you this. He says, and he says, this is what we speak. Not in words taught us by human wisdom. In other words, these are not things we learned in school or seminary or some higher order of thinking or philosophical school. But in words taught by the Spirit. These are words taught, the revelation was taught to the apostles by the Spirit. Expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. And again, what, what, what spiritual truths and spiritual words? That's this general revelation. This general revelation is the spiritual truth. The spiritual words are the text of Scripture. It's like, well, I don't know this spiritual language. The language is, this is it. It's like, is it tongues or something like that? Is it prophecy? No. This is the spiritual words expressing the spiritual truth given to them by the Holy Spirit. The man, now here it is, and we're closing this down. The man without the Spirit does not accept it. I, I think in, if you look at your notes, I've got a good definition of that somewhere. Man, I'm flipping through the notes fast here because I didn't. There's some more good stuff there. I skipped. There's more good stuff. It must be the last page. 14. Yeah. Oh, I know. I got, it's not on the page. It's on my Bible here. Okay. The man without the spirit does not accept. The word would be D-E-X-O-M-A-I in the Greek, we transliterated. It means to accept, to welcome, if it be a gift or a, a will or a positive comment. Or a, a comment. In other words, accept, to take an accept would be like, here is your inheritance. That's accept. Here is a gift. Happy birthday, I got you this gift. Accept. You would then accept the will. You would accept the inheritance. You would accept the gift. But the, the, listen, that's exactly what Jesus says. I am he. You will see the Son of Man come and come. I am the one you're waiting for. I am the bearer of truth, Pilate. I am your Messiah, Caiaphas. I am the gift. But the unspiritual man does what? Does not 
accept. He will not open the gift. He will not receive the inheritance. It's like, this is stupid. No, this is, this is your inheritance. This is what you've been waiting for. You've been praying about this. This is stupid. I don't want this. Blasphemy. It's like, I'm looking for answers. I'm looking for truth, okay? I have come out of eternity to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you what all of your Roman philosophy is looking for. I will I came to testify about the truth. Ah, uh, no one knows truth. No, I've got it right here. I've got it right here. It's like, no, I can't. I can't accept that. Why? Because they're unspiritual. It doesn't mean they're uh, unspiritual in this sense. Realize, everybody's spiritual. Everybody has access to the demonic world somehow. You know what I'm saying? There's the spiritual realm that's available to everybody. What he's saying in context here is, unspiritual in the sense that they don't accept the spiritual revelation. I've got to wrap this up. The man without the spirit does not accept. He says no to the gift. He says no to the inheritance. He does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Remember, these things that come from the spirit of God are things that have no being to the man, the general man, or the, the natural man. For they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them. Because they are spiritually discerned. You have to discern them with the spirit. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things. Now watch this right here. Be careful right here. This is, this is a great verse. If this just gets stuck on a refrigerator, mate, it's going to make everybody confused. You've got to keep this in context. The spiritual man, who's that? That's the born-again believer with the spirit, makes judgments, and judgments, that's the word discerns, about all things. The man who's born again, you, because you have the Spirit of God, you can discern, the word in the NIV is to make judgments, but you can discern, you can understand, you can process, you can come to the conclusion. It's not the word that doesn't mean right or wrong, yes or no. It means you can receive the information and make a decision. Once again, the spiritual man, because he's got the Spirit of God, the born again believer, can hear the special revelation and receive it, discern it, understand it, process the information, and go to the next step. They can make judgments about it, okay? This is not about judging right or wrong, true or false, guilty or not guilty. This is about discerning truth. Pilate was unspiritual. So when Jesus says, I came to testify about the truth, he says, I have no idea what you're talking about. When, he had, when Peter, Jesus asked Peter, he says, who do men say that I am? And he says, who do you think I am? Peter says, you're the son of the living God. And Jesus says, Flesh and blood did not reveal it to you, but the Spirit of God revealed it to you. That was discerned by the Spirit. You were able to discern. You were able to judge and rightly answer my question because the Spirit of God has revealed it to you. Pilate, didn't, was, it did not, was not revealed to Pilate. It was revealed to Peter. What? The Spirit made the difference. So we'll read this again. Uh, because they, his, uh, scroll, let me go back to verse 8, 14. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually discerned, judged, understood. The spiritual man makes judgments or discerns about all things, because he's spirit, the Spirit of God is with him. It's not because he's brilliant, not because he's wise, not because he went to seminary, because the Spirit of God is revealing it to him. He says, okay, I understand that, I know what to do. But he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. In other words, again, that doesn't mean if the cop pulls you over for speeding, you don't grab this verse and say, I'm a spiritual man, you can't judge me, and just take off. You know, you'll end up in jail, rightfully so. That's not talking about not being able to be held accountable or you, your actions to be judged. That means when we start following the special revelation, not doing weird things, just doing things in a line with the age that is coming, like presenting the gospel, like living the Christian life, of having the priorities that line up with this special revelation, like living a life of love. When you start doing this, this spiritual man who discerns and makes judgments and knows how to behave in all situations because he can process it, this spiritual man cannot be judged or cannot be discerned, or say it again, cannot be understood by the natural man. It's like this man does not understand this man. Just like Pilate could not evaluate it. It's like, Jesus, you're crazy. They're going to kill you. Caiaphas did not understand Jesus. Jesus gave him the best gift, but he could not judge him accurately. So that does not mean because you're acting weird in the grocery store following the spirit to pick out your cereal, you can't judge me. Yeah, I can too. That's weird. It means when you start evaluating the word of God and applying it to your life, it's like, this spirit, this natural man is not going to be able to make a, 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 it's like, 
I don't understand what you're talking about. I mean, it happens to me frequently. We'll be talking to someone, and I'll say, well, you know, like, you know, the Word of God, or we're sending books over here, or we're doing something that's just like, yeah, I don't know if that's a good thing to do. It's kind of like, well, I know you don't. I mean, talking to, a, a, say, an unbeliever, I don't even want to say unbeliever, talking to a Christian who does not, I mean, a Christian who's just sold out and come right back up here. It's like, well, it's like, right, never mind. We're functioning down here. The Holy Spirit has revealed the Word of God to us, and we're following this truth, teaching this truth. If you're even in a church up here, and, and, and I don't understand this, we'll go up here where it's safe. Everybody agrees that we should all be nice to each other. Everybody agrees that we should all you know, make more money in business. Everybody agrees, and we talk about these things, and they're like, what are you doing? It's like, you know, no one's going to come to your church if you just keep teaching the Word of God. You're going to have to do more than that. You're going to have that potlucks or something. It's like, <laughs> right. The natural man cannot discern this. The spiritual man can judge all things and understand and move forward in God's plan. This man can't pro I don't know. This makes no sense. Right. It's, it's, uh, it's out of your league. Because you're still thinking here. You're still thinking general revelation. We're done here. I'm reading one more verse. The spiritual man makes judgments or discerns, understands about all things. But he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. Or is not subject to any man's understanding. Or any man, no man, what are you doing? Verse 16. For he has, or excuse me, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Who can go and tell God, here's what we're going to do? No one can. You can't go up here and tell God what to do. But guess what? Right here. But we do have the mind of Christ. What do you mean we have the mind of Christ? In context, it's not some magical thing that happened. We, we, we have the mind of Christ. What? The Spirit of God has revealed to us the understanding of the revelation. You have the mind of Christ. That, 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 you, that, you understand what I'm saying? It's not something magical. It's, 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 this is it. God has revealed it to you. He revealed himself in nature to the natural man. He revealed himself to believers by the power of the Spirit through the Word of God. And now you have the mind of Christ. Right here. So we continue with that next week. And Paul will continue building his case. I've got to quit because we're running out of time. I appreciate your patience. Uh, I try to keep it all in context so all those words kind of move the same way so that whole chapter moved together. That doesn't mean it all that's necessarily accurate. You could branch off in different ways. You're going to start talking about the deep things of God and go somewhere else with it. I made fun of that, but maybe you shouldn't do that. I also said the spirit of God, uh, the rulers were, were Pilate and Caiaphas, for example, the government leaders. If you're going to talk about angelic forces, going to put a different twist on it. And, and there's different ways of teaching that. So just keep in mind, I was talking about general revelation and special revelation and the Holy Spirit revealing the Word of God to you so that you can move on in the plan of God that's been revealed. That's, that's why I was approaching that. I think that was a Corinthians problem. I think they went back to Greek philosophy instead of staying with Paul's revelation and, and what the Spirit of God revealed. They are born again. They are born again. But they felt more comfortable up here than continuing right here. Father, we thank you again for your truth. We ask that we may uh, abide by what your information has told us. We ask that we would follow your spirit. We ask that we would embrace the things that you've revealed to us. Father, we ask that we live a life of wisdom, both in this natural age, but also, also Father, in, in the age that you're, you're preparing to bring to us. We ask that we would be diligent in the things you've given to us and that you continue to lead us. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the spirit that abides with us. And we thank you for the chance for Christian fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time.